let's talk about a few development best practices. This is really where you put your logic together, custom for your own application, and how well you do this is really going to influence your application's workload consumption. Your database structure is one of the biggest factors that can have a really strong influence on things. So here are a few tips to keep in mind when you're putting together that architecture. First, it's generally better to have more data types with fewer fields than less data types with more fields. This approach helps break down the data into smaller parts, making it more efficient for Bubble to fetch it. So don't be afraid to create more data types to break things down. Next, list fields. List fields can really work for or against you. So understand when it's appropriate to use them. The more items in a records list field, the bigger that single record is gonna be and make a search query of that data type much heavier. On the other hand, list fields can be a fantastic way to keep nested repeating groups, for example, more optimized. But just remember that different structures can be more or less forgiving. You're just going to have to try out and see what works best for your specific use case. Option sets. Use option sets to manage a list of choices that don't need to be managed by your users wherever you can, because option sets are not a part of your database. So they're more efficient than regular search queries. I can't stress the importance of your data structure enough. And this is actually one of the very first things we make sure our own entrepreneurs have right. It's the foundation of your data-driven app. So if you want help building that foundation too, from your database structure all the way to your pilot launch, apply for a strategy call over at coachingnocodeapps.com slash call. We'll help you create a custom roadmap for your app's development, and then see whether it'd be a good fit to help you turn that roadmap into a scalable pilot app. Next, let's talk about your repeating group structures. Repeating groups are a type of element that are so flexible, you have many different ways of designing lists. You wanna be very careful with this as well because you can really hurt your performance or help it. So first you wanna avoid doing database searches inside of the repeating group cells whenever you can because that's just going to multiply with every cell. If you can, store the information you need in a, a separate field within a database record, use custom states, use contained list fields if possible. You also want to take a look at the repeating group's design. So how many rows and columns are you having bubble load in one time? What's your paging system going to look like if the repeating group is uh, you know, loading lots and lots of items all at once? Now let's talk about modifying data. When you're creating or updating data, it's much more efficient and cost effective to update more database fields and fewer actions than it is to update less fields across multiple actions. Uh, right? You're, you're running less change actions uh, which is going to cost you less workload units. So if you can try to use a single save button uh, to commit input values or custom states to a record, that's much more efficient than auto binding or uh, updating something every time an input's value is changed, especially if you have many inputs involved. Okay, those Each of those changes are just going to cost more workload units. As far as deleting records go, that can also chip away at your workload units pretty quickly. So put in measures to prevent unnecessary deleting to begin with. For example, instead of creating a blank record before a user starts filling in information, require the user to enter some, if not all data if possible, uh, and then create the record. At that point, they're at least committed to what they've entered in. They're more likely to uh, not abandon the process. And overall, you just want to reduce the number of blank or orphaned records that will eventually be deleted anyway, which are just gonna cost you more workload units. Now let's talk about searching your database, because this can come with varying levels of complexity. Try constraining your search as much as you can uh, before you try to load more information than you really need to the browser and for the user to start working with. The more manipulations you add after a search, the more expensive things are going to get, the more complicated it is, uh, and the more workload units potentially uh, that are going to cost you. What about calculated values? You can always calculate in real time on the page, but that could come at the cost of having more searches than you really need. You need to perform calculations such as total amount of unpaid invoices or a number of followers. Save that calculated value to a record. Use a workflow for that to reduce unnecessary real time searches uh, and instead just watch for updates to update the record whenever necessary. Now, this does work best for calculations that don't need to be updated often. Otherwise, the number of database changes could actually outweigh the cost of a search. So it's something that you're going to have to balance. Now, consolidating searches. Bubble is smart enough to perform one search if it sees multiple identical queries. However, you want to leverage things like custom states and previous steps in a workflow to access data that has already been fetched wherever possible. Again, the idea here isn't necessarily to eliminate all of these high-cost activities, but simply to reduce them wherever possible.
Now let's talk about recurring workflows. This is a type of workflow that requires the most vigilance because it is easy to create an accidental infinite loop in the backend uh, environment or to have just unnecessary workflows running every X number of seconds uh, to check for updates or check, check for changes that are happening. Use conditions to ensure that you're only running these actions when necessary. You want workflows to have a clear beginning and a clear end as much as possible. But do be mindful that a recursive workflow is preferred over making a change to a list of things when that list is over 100 items or so. Uh, it's just a more performant operation. Now, when you're working with server-side plugins and API calls, there are a number of things to be aware of here as well, especially since every configuration with an external service can have its own uh, requirements and its own uh, considerations to look after. When you're designing a call to an API uh, or using a plugin as a data source in your design, avoid setting a container's default data source, so a group or a repeating group. Uh, to that API response or to that plugin data. What you want to try to do instead is use a condition so that it only triggers those calls when the environment is right, right? Uh, this could also help you avoid any wasted calls. It can help you avoid any errors. A lot of times with API calls and plugin data, you have a lot of requirements that you need to fill in first. You may need to provide IDs for things. You may need to have uh, inputs filled in in order to populate the, the API request. So use a condition in order to trigger the call or have the user click on a button to trigger the call. Try to avoid setting these data sources um, as a default, where as soon as the page is loaded, Bubble tries to run the calls. Again, it could, uh, in effect, create wasted calls or generate you know, errors that are really unnecessary. 